My name is Kevin Butterfield, the director of the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress, and it is my great pleasure to introduce you to today's speakers. The Kluge Center is one of the sponsors of this year's festival. We're proud to bring America's most beloved writers to this room. The Kluge Center works to bring scholars into residence, to work in the collections of the world's largest library, and to do work of the sort that you're hearing about at today's National Book Festival. I want to welcome everyone who is joining us live on C-SPAN today as well. We're proud to partner with C-SPAN. Our next panel is Records of Survival, Escaping Genocide and Human Trafficking. And it features Tahir Hamad Isgil, Saket Soni, translator Joshua Freeman, and Jason Rosian. Tahir is one of the foremost poets writing in the Uyghur language. His new book is Waiting to be Arrested at Night, a Uyghur poet's memoir of China's genocide. Saket is a labor organizer and human rights strategist and the founder and director of Resilience Force. His first book is titled The Great Escape, a true story of forced labor and immigrant dreams in America. Joshua is a postdoctoral fellow at the Princeton University Society of Fellows and a lecturer in Princeton's East Asian Studies Department. And our moderator, Jason, writes for the Washington Post opinion section and is the author of Prisoner, My 544 Days in an Iranian Prison, Solitary Confinement, A Sham Trial, High Stakes Diplomacy, and the Extraordinary Efforts It Took to Get Me Out. Please join me in welcoming them. I want to thank everybody for being here today and everybody watching at home. Um, it, this is an extraordinary honor and privilege uh, for me. I, I feel like over the last couple of weeks, I I've gotten to know Tahir uh, and Saket intimately through these really incredible books. And I encourage everybody here uh, to, to read them. They are stories of resilience, hope, tragedy, loss. Uh, and, and so much more that illuminates the human experience. Uh, but what struck me was that it let, both books really led us into worlds that we hear about sometimes very superficially, uh, but really take us inside. Um, and I am a kind of optimistic person. I've been through my own share of hardship, and I, I try and think about things in a positive way when I can. Uh, and, and one of the themes in both books that, um, that I just wanted to start off with, because there's a lot of heavy stuff as well, uh, was the theme of food. Uh, and there's an incredible moment uh, in Tahir's book that stuck out for me when they're arriving in the United States for the first time, and they're trying to pass through customs. And they have two boxes of bread from, uh, from, from the Uyghur country that they brought with them to sustain them in the United States. And the custom agent is asking what's in the box. And Tahir doesn't know how to explain what naan is. And his wife says, why don't you just tell them it's naan? And Tahir does that. And the custom agent knows what naan is. I guess naan has become pretty internationally known as bread. And in, in Saket's book, there's many, many great scenes around food. Uh, and I, I would like to just start by talking about uh, the, the comfort uh, that food brings uh, to, to you both, to the characters in your book, and the peoples of your communities. Maraba non non skandigan de sang bomam da degenda sh tamosh adamla chende sha tamakhtinke role and the kitabdiki role kitabdiki muimlagi hatta hayat onstiki ahmet aqda azraq be sözlap began be sözlap began bosanda rahmat birinchi avlat amerika va kochman bob kagalla bolishibdimiz bilan tamak bob uzimizni ananvi tamaklari as first generation Americans, food is a really important thing in our lives. Uh, 
مشهد نان ارقلب تامق مز تامق مسیم زلق لایل دب ویلگان. اون اون استیگ ایوغلاد برگه با نان انسان قام را ولد و نهگ باسه چوکم الیلیش کرکت ایلگان. شما بو نقطه بزشون نایت مهم بر احمد گیگه. When we first came to America, we took a lot of naan with us. Uh, we figured that if we had any difficulty finding stuff to eat, we would just solve that by eating naan. Uh, and in addition, uh, Uyghurs have a saying that uh, naan is a companion, and wherever you go, you should take naan with you. Um, well, you know, I arrived in the United States um, at the age of 20, uh, not really knowing how to boil an egg uh, or even how to warm water up. Um, and uh, my cooking lessons um, really started when I met the characters in this book, in particular a man who lived behind a labor camp but would sneak out to meet with me clandestinely. And um, I'd have a one-pot plug-in oven ready uh, in a hotel room, and he'd teach me how to make the simplest of Indian dishes. They were all the things I grew up with, all the things that were mysteries to me um, as I grew up. And suddenly I was learning how to make them because he needed me to give them to him to smuggle into the camp where um, starvation was a rule uh, of, of the labor camp. So um, my, my journey with food started really right as I started my relationship with these extraordinary characters in this book. And, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to report that uh, uh, it only went up from there. I still cook, um, and, and the characters of the book and I get together and, and, and cook together a few times a year. It is a really incredible through line, and there's a couple of recipes in the book uh, as well, and I'm looking forward to, to getting into them. I also want to talk about the lure um, of America and uh, the realities that people face uh, when they get here. In, in both books, it's, it's a very different experience. Uh, but I think there's, there's so much that uh, we as Americans can learn from the experience uh, of new immigrants. And I just want to read a quick quote from Tahir's book. Uh, he was telling one of his friends that he intended to travel to America with his family. Um, and this friend was in the United States. And he said, it would be best if you didn't come to America. I didn't ask him why he said this, and he left without explaining further. I, c I took him to mean that a Uyghur intellectual like me could do more for our people by remaining in our homeland. I still think sometimes of the contemplative look on Ilsat Hassan's face when he said this to me. And then I want to pull out a, a, a moment from, from Tahir's book as well, um, if I can find it. Uh, where they are kind of reminiscing about the experience of getting out of the labor camp years later. And it says, uh, one of, one of the, the workers uh, says, we're, we're Americans now. Why do we need to remember? And I think that it's so indicative of, of a, a fast moving country uh, that has its own past, but doesn't think about it very much. So I, I'd like you both to ruminate a little bit on, on what the, the mystique of America feels like uh, from far away and the realities when, when people are actually confronted with it. American in Jalab Kal Khabla, American Kirial Hakadabana Sorumba, American Girachtin Kurganda, Brichel Kurno, the Kimbar and the Kirial, Belkin Bash to Bolisha Monkin, Bolo Moma, Ilshatas and Gipe, Mabak Tasrikal, Boyer Kalmasang, Bobak, Vetan Kaitsang, and Enyakse, the Gangipe, Mabak Tasrikal de Shah, Shirt Trop, America Karap, Iskoran Rons Blan, Boyer Kagan and Kinki, Tasra Tons and Sustrop. Albette, Amrik Kilish was not asleep Pilan was a mess. Was Uzumus Ninke, Vatanimusden, Oil Lishne, Pilan Kumaran, Pakatla, Imkantims Yarbasa, Shkazimusne, and we show Amrik the Octomes de Poilan. Originally, we had no plans to come to the United States. Uh, we had no desire to leave our homeland. Uh, the most that we had originally thought about was that for our daughter's future, we hoped that they would be able to study in the United States. Albatta, Amerikanın ki bir büyük dolayı tıkalı ki ne, Amerikanın ki Amerikalı kesek, 
erkeklik yarıştıvallıkımızını, özümüzdeki bir hatalık yarıştıvallıkımızını bilettik. Of course, we knew that America is a great country, that if we, if we went to the United States, we'd be safe, that we would be free. We knew that. Lakin biz mecburi kaygan bağıtka Amerika gelip Amerika'daki erkeklikten bahraman bulaştın köre bekrek özümüzdeki vatandan ayrılan azaplık hissiyatımız küçük oldu. But we came to the United States not really of our own choice. We had to come, and because of that, uh, since we've since we've been here, uh, more even more or even stronger than the sense of receiving freedom has been our suffering from having to leave our homeland. Şu Amerika kıyakın neyken elbette bizden iki kızımız neydi hoş buldu. Biz mu bir hatırlık iriştik. Ama bizden ki ya da dostlarımız, köpleyen dostlarımız türümüde, uruk tutkalarımızdan ala kullanmayımız. Bu azap bizden bekleyelim. Hoşal bir yerde ki erkeklikten bekleyen buluşka, böyle məlum cihazdan toskunluk buldu. Since we've come here, um, our daughters are really enjoying a lot of things in the United States and we are uh, we're safe. But back home, uh, so many friends of ours are in prison, they're in confinement. Uh, we're unable to have any contact with our relatives back home. And all of this has made it difficult to, to fully enjoy uh, what we would have enjoyed here. I think that that experience of emigrating from um, a hostile environment uh, where you're constantly under threat and the hope that going to a new land will uh, change all that. Uh, the, the harsh realities of, of being cut off from your communities is something that I see a lot with Iranians and Cubans and, and many other groups. And um, I just want to say, and I will say this again and again, uh, we hear about the genocide and the concentration camps in, uh, in the Uyghur parts of, uh, of China. Uh, you really brought it to life, and uh, you know I think it's just a, a remarkable, uh, a remarkable story. Uh, Socket, I, I want to continue along that theme. Um, you know, in the quest to um, to really uh, to to free the the workers from India uh, in in, uh, in the south, um, and then their uh, subsequent quest to be uh, integrated uh, legally into U.S. society. There was this moment where you know, most of these men had worked in other countries uh, before and had figured out as guest workers how to work the system, move from one job to another. And one of them uh, sort of perplexed said, in Dubai, in Bahrain, in Baku, we know how to get free but how to get free in America. Talk about the struggle uh, of these, these men who believed they were coming to the US completely legally, completely uh, above board, made incredible sacrifices, took on great debts, uh, only to find themselves in servitude when they arrived. Yeah, the, the question, um, how to get free in America was, um, really a practical one asked by uh, an Indian worker who had been brought to the United States uh, and held in captivity um, in a labor camp. He slunk out of the neighbor camp to meet with me clandestinely and asked me that question, how to get free in America. Um, he was really asking about a bureaucratic process. Um, in Bahrain, there was a way to move from one employer to another, not in the United States. Um, the, the story really starts with this mysterious midnight phone call I got um, one night, it, months after Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast. Um, the Gulf Coast had become the world's largest construction site. It was seething with cash and corruption. And I was a labor organizer, um, and a man who was too scared to tell me his name um, told me he needed help. He was obviously from India. We spoke in Hindi. And I wondered what a man just arrived from India was doing in the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Turned out he was one of fi 500 Indian workers uh, recruited um, by recruiters in India, promised green cards and good jobs, and then brought into a labor camp. And there were no green cards 
uh, you know, in sight. So the man who asked me that question, um, he had paid $20,000 putting his home on the hawk, um, selling ancestral land, taking high interest loans um, to get to the United States. And so these men were being held in debt servitude, um, trapped in a labor camp, and asking me to trace a way out. The interesting thing, um, Jason, about their views on America, though, were that you know, they had more faith in America than most people born in the United States of America. They were from India, where you bribe a cop to get through a traffic light, or you bribe a judge. They thought here a company might have enslaved them, but if they petitioned the US government, um, it would protect them. What we didn't realize, what they didn't realize at the, at the time was that escaping from the labor camp in the style of a, a heist movie was only the first step. They would have to fight three years for their freedom. Um, it wasn't being handed to them on a platter. And I, I will tell you that the story takes many, many twists and turns. Um, and, you know, the, the characters who uh, are on the other side of the equation who you think of as um, evil uh, turn out to sometimes not be uh, inherently evil. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wanted to follow up by asking you about um, the reporting on this book. Uh, I think it's a, an incredible feat of uh, a reporting. Um, you, know, you get all sides of this story through first-person accounts that you actually um, were able to, 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 to get personally. Um, I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about how you maintain perspective and um, I don't want to say objectivity because it's sort of you know, not relevant. You, know, you don't need to be objective to, to write this story. Uh, but you came at it with an openness uh, that is rare. Uh, I'm thinking in particular of um, Alvin Lardner uh, and your, your relationship with him towards the end of the book. Um, just talk about how it was to report this um, with people who probably didn't want to talk about the things that you wanted to know about. Well, first of all, thank you, Jason. Coming from you, that's uh, an extraordinary compliment, and I'm very honored. Um, you know, in writing the book, um, when I thought about the main characters, the immigrants themselves, I thought about the ways that immigrants are portrayed in the news. The way most Americans um, understand immigrants is through uh, stories where immigrants are either the problem or they have a problem. Um, they're people who need to be saved. Um, by the same token, um, when I thought about the people at the center of the trafficking scheme, I thought about my initial reaction to those characters. Um, I initially thought they must be evil. And so writing about them would be a study in evil. Um, then I started the process of writing and particularly reporting. And Alvin Ladner is a particularly interesting character. He was uh, the immigration agent who was colluding with the company that was holding the workers in forced labor. When workers would run away, this is the ICE agent along with others who would go catch them and bring them back to the labor camp. Um, later on, he winds up um, in a, an extraordinary cover-up. He winds up appointing himself uh, as the lead law enforcement officer in the Department of Justice's investigation of that company, their investigation of him, essentially. Um, and um, all of this unfolded as I was writing, so I decided to find this Alvin Ladner, if he was still around, and um, I found an extraordinary um, manuscript uh, deep in the bowels of the Bay St. Louis Library um, called The Ladner Odyssey. It was an over 1,000-page um, volume about the long history of the Ladners, who started with a, um, an early immigrant um, and his family included you know, Confederate soldiers and slave catchers. Um, and I called up Mr. Ladner, and he agreed to meet with me on the steps of a church in Mississippi, uh, a library, sorry, in Mississippi, and I met with him. And what I wasn't ready for was that to really understand his role in this saga, 
I actually had to treat him like a human being. I had to be there, understand his incentives, his motives, uh, understand what his life was like around the time. And as often happens when you meet someone else as a human being, you know, you start to have a certain amount of empathy towards them. They are not just anymore the face of an institution, an institution that I've spent most of my career fighting. Um, they're now an individual often used by that institution. Um, and so remarkably, uh, Mr. Ladner and I ended up um, in an hours long summit on the steps of this library um, in a kind of rapport and we've continued our relationship. Um, I, I brought him a, a, a bushel of sausages uh, to begin that conversation. We bonded over food. Um, and then he told me this extraordinary story. And I, just as a taste, um, I ended up being far more, I, you know, I came to meet him in order to fight him. But I, but I left with my own worldview a little bit expanded by him. Um, I, was, I was returning to a different reality than I had left. I, I want to reiterate, it's an incredible um, feat of reporting that um, you know, I think will be taught in journalism classes for a long time. So it's Thank just you. A, it's a great. Thank you. Um, Tahir, I, I, I want to talk a bit about life in Urumqi uh, before the mass incarcerations. Uh, you bring this city to life for us. And um, I think oftentimes when we think about life in an authoritarian state, especially uh, in the uh, parts that are further away from the capitals, be it China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, we think about these places where uh, you know, life is very um, orderly, organized, and uh, controlled. Uh, but there are clearly um, cracks in the system. There are differences of uh, opinion among people in the system. There are good guys, there are bad guys. Uh, it, it's a, a three-dimensional place. Uh, I'd like you to talk about life there and the slide towards a surveillance state that, um, that it became. Men çoğun tutkunluğum Vrunk Ürümçü hakkında bir nasıl sormak için. Siz nahi de obrazlık, nahi de canlılık tasvirli doğunuz. Biz işte kontrol aslındaki bu da bu muzdabit özetlerdeki turmuşunu biz oylayan çağda. Biz nahi de hiç kanı yoçuk yok bir oylayımız hem de. Bütün kontrol içi de de oylayımız. Emeliyat yoçukla bağ. Emeliyat sisteminin içi de herkıl adamla buldu, yakış adamla buldu, yaman adamla buldu. Herkıl adamla buldu. Siz çoğun tutkunluğum Vrunk Ürümçü'deki kündürük turmuş hakkında azıraq sözlep, andan az da az da muşunda kalıqa çoğun tutkun muşuna iğır zulumga Kitbağan Ceryan'la bir azraq bir sözler bir amsız. Çoğun tutkundum burun ki turmuşumuz gerçe naydı cık rejimla cık besimla bozumu ama yan dağım dış attı. Çünkü bu da mutlak erkillik bulmağındak mutlak rejimi mevcut demez. Our life before the mass internments um, even though there were all kinds of controls, even though there was all, kind of pressure, all kinds of pressure, uh, life went on. Because just like there's no such thing as perfect freedom, there's no such thing as perfect control either. Uh, biz, uh, Bunun da insanlar künudu. Bu künüş diyen bu ruhiyalet insaniyetin nayt muhim bir alaydık ki. Even though there was surveillance all over the place, and even though the different forms of control seeped into every aspect of life, one gets used to it. Uh, that's one of the most important parts of being human: is our ability to get used to things. Şunu biz turbüşümüzdeki nurunlukan rejimlerini bizden bir neç dostlarımız var. Bula oltrup biz onu yumur gaylandırmız, biz onu çakçak gaylandırmız, muşunda kılıp yürüp biz ruh icat ki üzümüzün keyfi adımızın tanış etmemiz. And these different kinds of control and these different types of repression, actually when we spent time with our friends, we would make jokes about them, we would turn them into humor. 
And that was a really important way for us to deal with them and to go forward in our lives. Uh, Aşın meselelerini yakış hal kılışının ki yakışın o takabul turşının e, yollarını e, biz icat kılımız. E, Ana diyeceğim her kanda kıyın şerayetti mi? Bazı sözlüklerini, bazı yüzümüz hastalar kılık e, birbirimizge aşın da bir zulümne e, işbirliğimiz mesela kitaptı mı ba e, tutkun kılınan yatakta balnist yetip kaptı, e, öyle ki saçlar kıyagende mihman geldi, vaziyet özgergende şamal çıktı dedi gendek. We would invent all kinds of ways to deal spiritually with the impact of what was going on. Uh, just to take one example that's in the book, uh, we would find ways to express, we'd find our own language to express what was going on. For example, if somebody were sentenced to prison, uh, we would say they were in the hospital. Uh, if a police officer was in our home, we would say uh, we have a guest in our home. Zulum. <laughs> Turmuşumuzdan hem bir tarafı sınıf etken, emniyet onundan kurtuluş e, mümkün emez. Bunda kavalası da şu birden bir yol, e, onun künüş ve onu e, bir hıl aktif tarafı buraş arkalık hayatını dağımlaştırış. And this kind of repression seeped into every aspect of our lives. There was no way around it. Uh, the only way to deal with it was simply to get used to it uh, and to find ways to allow ourselves to continue through our lives day by day. Amde şikemen o yeten cildi ki çok tutkundum burun ki hayatımızda mı kadem mi kadem besim iş mangan. Bunda besim bizden vatanımız izcil dağınmış geldi. And before the mass internments began in 2017, uh, the repression in our country increased step by step. Uh, it wasn't a sudden process. Bizim de muşunda kündelik turmuşumuzda. Meslen aşinaydı kadırla öyle kırdı kırp üyümüzdeki bizdenki dini itkat ahvalımız ne üyümüzdeki pilalık tutuk boysunuş boysun maslak ahvalımız ne ana dikin mihman sırtın mihman geldi mu o kançilek turdu o kimle muşunun en mesi putle nazarat aslı turdu bunda mesala intayın köp. Uh, there are many examples but just to take one of them uh, neighborhood committee cadres would come into our homes. And they would ask us questions about our religious observance. They would ask us questions about whether we were following the government's birth quota policies, about whether any guests had come to our home. And bunda kışlanı beştin keçümüken ademle tasavvur kılışı bektes bu kışlanı. Şuna ben kitapta köprek küçük detallarını kündelik turmuşunu yazdım. Bu bir zulümlü düşünüşünün ki naitin muhim bir terpi edip karayma. For those who have not been through things like this, uh, that can be pretty difficult to imagine. So in the book, uh, I tried to bring this home to people with small details uh, by focusing on uh, different aspects of this and how it manifests in your daily life. I just want to follow up. Um, you talked about uh, the importance of humor. And uh, there is a early chapter about your hubris and um, I think really acknowledging a very self-aware book that you know you didn't think that it could go this way or would go this way. And I think in states like China, Iran, other authoritarian countries, um, the, 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 the grounding out, the, the killing of humor is such an important part of uh, the system's agenda. Scare you into not uh, being able to laugh, even as the things that they are doing or forcing you to do become more and more comical and farcical. Um, I'd like you to talk about that a little bit, and then I'd like to know, um, the book gets increasingly uh, fewer jokes and more serious as it goes on. Can you laugh again? Yumur haqqida bina sorgum kelevatida. Bu kitabda yumur haqqida Bolum o desek ki babla ne birisi meden kıramlaşın. Yumurt ki hele uşraydı bu kitabda ama muşna mustabet ve kimetler ne bir mahkste yetmek için bulgan bir nişane yumurdan yoktur. Kitap da ispildim. Kitap ne okuansırık çakçakla azlaydı. Yumur azlaydı. Çünkü babla da yumur azrak. 
Şu an müşüyüm rəqda azraq bir sözlər bəsəniz. Andı yenə birisi, andı hazır yumur nə? Siz yenə qayıt ruhalarla doğunuzma? Yumur qayı yenə erişdə doğunuzma? Əqiqdən aşında dəsləb ki, məzgillərdə biz Künlük durmuştu bu otkan özgürlüklerini aşında yumur gaylandırdık, özra birbirimizi çakçak kılış arkalık, birbirimizi çakçak kılıp, hatta yüzümüzün zanlık kılış arkalık, bırakıl yumur icat kılattık. It's true. In the earlier chapters, there's a lot about uh, humor. It was a big part of our lives, uh, making jokes about everything that was happening about us, around us, and even making fun of ourselves. It was really important. Elbette, hükümet taraf bunda bırakıl yumurlanı çakçaklanı yaptımaydı. Ola bunda çakçaklan yaxtumayla qanmay, ədibi əsərlədin, şəxsən şiirlədin, hər xil mənələni izdəydi o. Aşınıqdın, üzüqi qarşı bir xil mənələni bayıqsa, ya ki tepvasa, o adam avarcılıq qıfçıraydı o. Of course, the government does not like humor, and it looks for all sorts of real or imagined anti-government messages, even in poems or in song texts. And uh, if the state manages to find something, or if the state manages to make something up, uh, one could really be in trouble over that. And bu yumur diğer nesne bırakıl çıllık ne esli kayıt duruş arkalık ameliyat ne tekim esli yandırış arkalık fayda buludu. Albuki bağırlık diktatörlerin gemisi ameliyattan korkudu. Humor is something that makes reality even clearer. Humor is something that gives reality back to us. And reality is precisely what a repressive government is afraid of. Uh, Yumur toku gidek, birbirimiz yumur gidek ahval kalmadı. Hatta şiir okşaş güzel neslenimi tasavvur kılış kıyım oldu. It's true, there's a lot more humor in the earlier chapters of the book. And after the mass internments began, uh, we did feel like humor was lost to some degree. Uh, it was even a little hard to imagine beautiful things like writing poetry. Uh, bunda havalası dememiz... Uh, Əmimiz bir xil cimcitliqni, yəni bir xil sükünlə talıdıq. In a situation like that, we all chose silence. Amerika kəgənlikin hazırmı şu, bu cəşmi uzuncılıq dost biz il həm yəni davamlıq aş vəziyyətini, şüəd boğa işləni yumur qılımız, şüəd boğa işləni çaxçaq qaylandırmız, Aşında bir xil, aşında bir xil usul biz də azıq işləyən davamlaşdı. Amerika kəndikin bu qayta bizdə yana qayta davamlı işməyə vəti bu. And after we came to America, we got the humor back. Josh is an old friend of ours and he lived in our homeland for a long time. So with him and with so many of our other friends here, we do use humor as a way to deal with it all. I'm glad to hear that. Saket, I wanted to ask you uh, similarly. I mean, the, the men in, in your book are facing extraordinary odds. Uh, everything's stacked against them. Uh, they've given up everything to come here. Uh, but that ability to continue laughing and making fun of their own uh, circumstances seems to uh, never fully run out, except for with the case of, of one character, um, and I, I just I'd like to to know where some of those folks are now, and um, do you still have gatherings with them from time to time, and are the the memories even more funny as as the years have passed? You know, um, while the men were trapped in the labor camp in Mississippi and and in Texas. Um, Humor and play were sort of just the necessary uh, antidotes to these extraordinary pressures that were building up. Um, you know, inside the labor camp, the men lived 24 people to a trailer uh, in um, a trailer park built in a toxic 
uh, dump on company property behind barbed wire fences. Um, the men were forced to eat frozen rice for months on end uh, as their only sustenance um, and worked incredible shifts, 12-hour shifts round the clock um, you know, on starvation uh, nutrients. Um, and, you know, they, you know, outside the labor camp in India, um, money lenders were circling. Um, they had debts. So these enormous pressures built up. And so, um, you know, when I met the men, um, they, they, they suddenly found um, uh, in me um, an extraordinary source of comic relief. You know, they wanted the person who helped them to be a um, Harvard-educated attorney wearing a suit. I was a 27-year-old labor organizer who didn't even own a suit. Um, you know, they, they wanted someone who could litigate their case. Um, you know, I was talking to them uh, in the catechisms of labor organizing. Um, and so I think it helped them to make merciless fun of me at first. <laughs> Um, over time, they grew to trust me, and particularly with my friend Rajan, um, who was my partner in carrying out The Great Escape, there were uh, acts of necessary humor. For example, um, just a taste, but the, the Great Escape itself that's at the center of the book, um, uh, not to give anything away, but it involved a lot of uh, wild turkey whiskey and flavored cigars as bribes to guards. And we created this incredible, extraordinary pretext uh, of a fictitious Indian wedding um, as the way to get 500 men out from under the labor camp, uh, out from under the noses of the guards. And Rajan would call me secretly. Uh, and these clandestine calls would run like, how's the wedding going? How's the horoscope? And I'd say, the stars are aligned, which meant the Department of Justice is getting ready to receive our complaint. Um, it's getting about time. So there was a lot of code and a lot of humor in all of that code. Um, you know, wonderfully now, we can all sit, eat, and make jokes uh, in the freedom of America. Um, the men did escape from the labor camp. Um, I had the incredible pleasure of attending their citizenship ceremonies year after year. Um, and we still have um, Thanksgiving gatherings to commemorate um, those dark days in the labor camp when men were starving and would dream about food. Do you make dal for that? I, dal, I now do make dal, although uh, you know, those, those Thanksgivings are uh, a little more extravagant than that. There's a, there's a lot of mutton curry. Fantastic. <laughs> um, I, I want to encourage folks that have questions. We've got microphones up here. I've got a couple of more questions I'd like to ask, but um, I think we should maybe start lining up because uh, I hope there's many. Uh, this is a good crowd. Um, Tahir, uh, I think a lot of times we uh, look to uh, these countries, uh, these situations uh, of repression, uh, and we think about those societies as somehow antiquated or behind. One of the things that really struck me was the way that the Chinese Communist Party uh, uses technology in very sophisticated ways to track the movements of Uyghurs. Um, and there are scenes where you talk about the, the uh, equipment and, and tools that they use to do that. We think here of, uh, of technology as sort of a benefit of living in the modern world. Uh, in many ways, it feels like an enemy in your book. Um, has that gotten progressively worse? And um, is there any hope that uh, the use of technology in China uh, could be uh, for the benefit of people rather than uh, for the overall repression of them? Is that much not most of the land oil ganda? I'm probably keen to go under that. The tasawur kulmas. Amelia ta amas in kitaos ni kuyanda ma is kulam. Jungo kumparti sair khel jukri tekhnik din paidlab. Uzni ke zulumne kuchayte do. Kitad na agan chombr tasarat mo shbolde. Sham sizin surmach bogonam. Mo sho jungo ke jukri tekhnika sizin ke badkem ijabi tarafdar bolishi mumkin mo kien. 
ya ki fakat muşu zulüm terap ki karab mağamda o teknik ayakta muşu bolab mağamda nazaret nazaret ki muhasbetlik teknik ayakta o ilgandan olsun azrak bir hem berlap egem basans. Bu nazaret sistemi se teknik ana terapi kılışı insan için faydalık bir faydalık bir nesne. Bu aslı faydalık terap kişilik ise elbet yakışı buludu. Of course, technology is invented so that it will be useful for humanity. And obviously there are all kinds of positive aspects uh, of technology, things that it brings to us. Uh, but in many dictatorships, uh, notably uh, in the People's Republic of China, uh, the government is using technology as a way to surveil uh, the people. Bu albatta hammamizning ko'ngli yerim qiladigan ham bir xil texnikaga nisbatan kishilarni o'ylantirgan bir masala. Of course this is a really depressing reality and it also makes one think uh, about the implications of technology. Ham bu texnikaniki axloq bilan bo'lgan munosabatda izchil turda muzakara qilinayotgan izchil turda talash tartibi bir masala. Bu masalani hal qilish bu bizning hammamizning kunlik turmushimiz bilan munosabatlik. The conversations and the debates about the relationship between technology and morality have been going on for a long time. And the uh, these debates are actually really relevant to all of our lives. Shun bu nasl qanunlish kerak. Mayli diktator davlatlarida bo'lsin, mayli chet tillarida bo'lsin. Meningki ko'z qarashimda men ashunda bir texnikaning ziyankashligi uchragan bir kishi bo'lish uchun bilan bu nasniki bir qanun doirasida hal qilinishni va axloqiy jihatda nazoratga ega bo'lishni orzu qilaman. These are problems that need to be solved by the rule of law, whether in dictatorships or in other contexts. The rule of law is the way to deal with them and as somebody who has personally been negatively affected by the misuse of technology, I would really want to emphasize that point. Thank you. I'm going to start right here. Um, hello. <laughs> uh, this question, I guess, is for Tahir and his translator. Um, uh, so I have your book, but I haven't read it yet. And knowing that you're a poet and you wrote this memoir and now it's translated, I am not a poet, but I have tried to translate quite a bit of poetry, and it's usually for poets that have long been dead. So I have to track down people who actually speak the language and ask them about it. And what I've learned through translation is that sometimes you're missing or you have to transcribe orientation because language not only helps us communicate, but it also holds context and history and relationships with things like gender or politics or just space. So I guess my question is going forward, is there something that maybe you felt um, couldn't be translated from the Uyghur version to the English version? I don't know, a taste, a smell, an orientation, a color, an aesthetic, a mood that um, you would encourage me or anyone reading your book to keep in mind um, when reading the memoir. Well, I just want to ask you a Tajmajariyanda <gülüyor> Hem tercüme dedim bak estaydıl. Hem bütün şu şiirlerin tercüme kanacağı da bolsun ya ki müşk kitabın tercüme kandı bolsun. Zıcıl turda asıl tekske sadık ne asasî prensi kaptırıp tercüme kıldı. Hem cik meselede biz özra fikir almıştırıp durmuz. Bu noktaya kanacağı da ben naite telaylık bir adam minin eserlerim ne müşu cahşına tercüme kandı mı açtım bir telay. Um, well, thank you for saying that. Um, he says, uh, uh, Josh knows Uyghur really well, and, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so whether it's translating poetry or translating my memoir, um, he's very concerned with uh, maintaining fidelity to the original text, but also bringing out the feeling of the original text. Uh, so throughout the process of writing and then translation, we talked a lot about uh, you know, how, things, how things might be expressed. Uh, so I feel fortunate about that. 
Um, okay. No, I should say something. Um, yeah, between, between any two languages, obviously, uh, there's some things that'll be harder to get across, some things that'll be easier. Um, there are definitely, I have sort of a, a running list in my mind of, of words and concepts that exist in Uyghur that either don't exist in English or that take a lot, of, a lot more words to express in English. Um, maybe the biggest thing for me is that the Uyghur verb system is incredibly rich and you can put one suffix after another on a verb to where it gets to be, I don't know, 15 syllables or something. Um, and, uh, you know, a Uyghur verb is sometimes an English sentence. So, Tayyar is a very um, kind of, he has a real economy of words, I would say, uh, both in his poetry and his prose. And that sometimes is very challenging to convey fully in English. Um, you know, you find one word turning into five words or something like that. So, um, that's kind of the one thing that I think about. Um, another is, uh, you're talking about context. Um, there are words in Uyghur, for example, I always call Tayyar Tayyaraka, which means uh, older brother Tayyar, which you would use for anybody significantly older than you. It would be very rude for me not to say that. Um, but we don't have these words in English. Uh, you know, older brother, older sister, et cetera. Um, so in the book, um, you know, there's, there's one explanation early on in English of you know, wh what these words mean, you know, Aka, the older brother, older sister. And then we just, after that, I just put them in italics because there's no, there's no good way to put it in English every time. So sometimes you can solve the problem just by actually using the word in the original language. But, you know, thanks for the question. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, well, come over here. So you mentioned you were a labor organizer, and the work that you did with these folks who were in these labor camps was clearly black and white, good and evil. Um, what about highly skilled H-1B technical workers in America? who are exploited by individual companies who sponsor their visas. Do, do you think that there's a parallel there? Well, um, I think the approach I took in my book is that it's actually not black and white uh, or good and evil. Um, you know, among the workers who arrived into the labor camps, there were people who were allied with me. There were people who were allied with the company. The company had moles all over the labor camp, including workers. And uh, in fact, the great escape really rested on my ability to convince the main company mole, who is now a very dear and deep friend of mine, um, to, to uh, break his ties with the company. Um, you know, the company fundamentally told a story that the workers believed and had no choice but to believe, which was um, that they'd paid all this money, they'd come to the United States, and they'd get green cards, which would make their debt servitude worth it. Um, that turned out to be a lie, but workers had to find their own way to, um, you know, to the truth. I, I could only take them so far. They had to change their minds. Some workers didn't change their minds uh, and fought against our campaign. Um, you know, similarly, um, I came to look at the people at the center of the trafficking scheme as people with motivations and incentives, um, not purely evil. And I think that's harder uh, for us to accept because when people are neither good nor evil, when they're part of an economy of motives and incentives, it actually implicates all of us. We're part of the culture that allows that economy to continue. We're all part of a culture that allows immigrants to be treated the way they are treated in the United States today. But your point about H-1B visas is a good one. Um, I think at the end of the day, there's a character in the book named Ebi Raju who, um, who expresses the longing of people who look at the United States and find it um, attractive. You know? and, um, and actually, as Tahir, uh, what is the word for older brother again? Aka. Uh, Tahir Akka was speaking. <laughs> I, my ears caught this word that is Arabic and it, it entered into Hindi as well um, called Majburi. Mm. Majburi, Majburi is very a, a very powerful word. It sort of exists somewhere between obligation and desperation. And the way Ebi Raju put it, he said that uh, you become a migrant because you need to um, leave the ones you love to help them live. And I think any migrant anywhere would rather stay at home and have, you know, family and community and language and culture. Um, but you leave the ones you love to help them live. And I think whether it's in the high-tech industry 
or anywhere else. That's a big part of why people leave. That's a great answer. Thank you very much. We're going to have time for a few more questions, but uh, if we don't get to all of them, I want to encourage everybody uh, to visit Tahir and Saket at, the, at their book signing booths uh, after the session. Hi, my question is for Saket. Um, so as an organizer myself, I often find myself struggling between these two warring ideas, right? That one, the system we're living within, this political legal context is inherently flawed, and therefore we should be working to you know, dismantle or radically change it, right? But also realizing that there are ways that we can work within that system in order to gain these small victories, right? So my question is, how do you sort of wrestle with these two ideas, you know, and recognizing that you, know, you have to sometimes work within this inherently flawed and exploited um, system in order to help people to find justice and to um, you know, live better lives. Well, thank you for uh, your work as an organizer, firstly. Thank you for carrying on. Um, you know, I struggle with that myself. Um, I think that um, it's important when you're an organizer to have time to really understand the interior lives of the people you're organizing. Um, they're not clients. They're not uh, people with a problem. They're people with sometimes more complex motivations than fit a simple press release or a straight line story about why an immigrant came or why someone needs asylum. You know, um, ideally, um, the laws of the United States would be updated to reflect humanity and its passions and complexity. Uh, unfortunately, we're always having to fit people into decades-old rubrics. Um, I tell the story in the book about how I was sitting with one of the main characters of the book and helping him fill out an application for a humanitarian visa meant for victims of trafficking. Uh, and I said, look, what's the most important thing you need to tell them? And he said, well, it's that I missed the birth of my son. I left India, I left a pregnant wife, my son was born, and I haven't seen the child who was born three years ago. And I said, you know, that, that's really important to you and me, there's no visa for that. <laughs> and that's the violence you sometimes have to do as an advocate, you have to fit people in to constructs that aren't the most important thing in their lives. So I think it's about finding the balance and making sure that everything you hear and see about people as an organizer, you're going back and helping, helping update the system so that the system is more humane. Thank you. Thanks, hi, um, Sean Carberry. And um, similar, I, I did a lot of journalism dealing with traumatic, difficult, Topics, and I'm curious about sort of your psychological and kind of mental health approach to having dealt with the stories that you were dealing with, seeing the things, hearing the things, um, how you compartmentalized, how that experience changed you, sort of where you put that, you know, how, how you work with that aspect of, of really absorbing a lot of things that are painful and also cause a lot of anger about what innocent people are going through. So how, how do you, you know, process that aspect of the experience? Yeah, thank you for that question. You know, um, in the book, I am writing, I'm a character in the book, and in the book I'm writing about my 29, 30-year-old self. Um, and that organizer uh, did a terrible job of um, you know, uh, being kind to himself, being kind to others, uh, and connecting deeply uh, with, um, with uh, you know, the complexities of trauma. Uh, all of that made for a much better character in a much better book, um, but that character did a very bad job of it. Um, you know, I think uh, one of the things that changed me was um, surprisingly in the midst of this very intense campaign, the thing that sustained me was my friendships with these men. And those friendships were really transformative. When I met them, 
I was a 20-something organizer who had lived in the United States for a long time. I, um, you know, I was um, estranged from home, um, from my parents. I hadn't called home in months. Um, my Hindi was rusty, and my connection to my origins were very frayed. Um, and the last people I expected to meet in the middle of the Mississippi Gulf Coast were 500 me people from India, many from my hometown. And in a way, the friendships with them helped me return home. And I think that's something that can sustain all of us uh, in a life of making change, is being connected to, uh, to your own home, whatever that might be for you. Um, that's what these men did for me, and I hope that for those of you who are out there, whether they're courageous librarians, you know, fighting, uh, you know, uh, public um, rancor or organizers, labor organizers, that you have a way of coming home at the end of the day where you can connect with the things that sustain you and the things that made you. Thank you. Um, I loved your epilogue. Like, I loved the whole book, but specifically the epilogue I thought was so interesting, and I've, like, thought about it so much since I've, like, reread it and reread it. I was just wondering if you might... Are you talking to me? Yes, talk it. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. That's amazing. Um, I appreciate that. I'm so sorry. I, <laughs> no, I no, bought no. your book today, Kai, here, <laughs> and I will be reading it. It wasn't... Um, I couldn't find it before, um, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, but yes, no, your epilogue is so good. And I was wondering if you might be able to expand upon the like nuance of choosing to remember and choosing to forget and how sometimes when we choose to remember something, we might be choosing to remember like a false narrative or like choosing to like forget certain pieces or like, I don't know, I'm just like so curious. I would like love to read a full book like of like your expanded epilogue. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Thank you so much. The, the idea for the epilogue was really handed to me in a conversation where I um, would go back to these workers um, after many years and say, well, I want to write a book about you. And some of them would say, absolutely, we have so many stories. But others would say, uh, as Jason quoted, we're Americans now. Why do we need to remember all that? And it seemed like even as new Americans, uh, it seemed like something that, that seemed to them to come with the, the, um, the, the uh, um, uh, American passport was the right to forget history. Um, that's so much of what we think um, that America is, the right to have a fresh beginning, yes, but that's unfounded in any history. And I, and I wanted to write an epilogue that went into the mysteries of that um, and unpacked that a little. So thank you so much for reading that. This is going to have to be our last question, sir. Please. OK, so this is a question to Tahir. I wanted to ask about the adapting to living in a surveillance oppressive state and also this role of hiding reality. As you mentioned, that reality is the greatest threat to, to an oppressive state. Because ultimately, you made the decision to escape. Some of your peers might have made this decision, might have not. But I was wondering, in your experience, how much this is this function and role of an oppressive Rain oppressive state to make these active deceptions to make things like you can still adapt to this, you can still live here instead of trying to to escape out of this system completely. Josh, we have to keep it a little bit short. I apologize. Okay. Yeah, Zulum asked uh, you put your finger on something really important uh, that's very much at the center of it. Um, the Chinese government does not want uh, Uyghurs in particular to know what's happening outside. Uh, it does not want people to have a full picture of it. It does not want people contacting those outside. Uh, it's a very important part of controlling information. And for precisely that reason, uh, many Uyghurs have, in fact, many Uyghurs in our homeland have been punished uh, simply for having relatives or friends abroad or for speaking to somebody abroad. Thank you very much.
Thank you, everybody, for coming. I want to encourage you all to buy these two extraordinary books, read them, share them. Thank you. Thank you.